we continue our discussion on the ionization of amino acids because apparently there are other details that we need to go into. At least for now, we know that we could follow this table in order to assess how the amino acid should look like. And we have already concluded that it's critical for us to always compare the pH of the given to the pKa values of the functional groups for us to determine how we will draw the functional groups, whether they would have a charge or not. Now, I want you to look at something here. Did you notice that when we had a pKa, sorry, a pH of 1, a low pH value, the charge was positive. But when we had a high pH value, something like 12, nearing 14, our charge was more to the negative side. And then somewhere in the middle, we also have the middle value. Does that make sense? Let's go back to this table. So in our table, what we see here is that when the pH is low, low enough to be lower than the pKa of something, we will always have the protonated form. So that is neutral in acidic uh, cases, positive in basic cases. When our pH goes higher, higher into the, to the point that it exceeds the pKa of something, the neutral becomes negative. Isn't that going towards the negative side, obviously? And the positive becomes neutral, which is, well, positive to neutral or zero is also going to the negative side, if you can imagine a number line. So basically, the idea is, as my pH goes up, the charge goes more negative. So hopefully you can see the pattern here. So now it's as if you can actually just make a shortcut wherein you just write all the charges, the possible charges, positive one, zero, negative one, then just assume that every time that a pKa here has been exceeded by your pH, the value of your charge goes down. And so I have something like that here drawn horizontally. So here are the three charges possible. Here are the two pKa's given for our amino acid, like so. And here on top, I really had a lot of detail here. You can imagine some sort of slider. You can think of this as a dynamic area, wherein the pH can range from 0 here all the way to 14 here. And then, at this point, you can imagine the pH is exactly 2.4, which is also the pKa. And then here, my pH, if my pH is landed here, is landing here, it's equivalent to the pKa of 9.9. .9. So meaning, the area between this and this is anything between 0 and 2.4. The area here, between here and here, is 2.4 to 9.9. .9. And anything greater than 9.9 .9 is 9.9 .9 to the maximum of 14. So given that, we can actually imagine our pH to be placed somewhere from 0 to 14, and wherever we are, we're going to find the charge closest to that. For example, pH 1. So at pH of 1, 1 is more of, if this is 0, this is 2.4, 1 is something here. Of course, this is just an estimate. So since 1 is very close to this charge of positive 1, then we can probably assume that at pH 1, the charge is positive 1. With this crude method that we're doing, the shortcut method, we actually get the same answer as a while ago, right? Or for example, what if my pH is 5.5? Well, 2.4 is here, 9.9 .9 is here. So 5.5 is somewhere in the middle of those two values, and it is very close to 0, so maybe the charge is 0. And uh, we also had that a while ago. So for the pH of 12, obviously 12 is greater than 9.9. .9, so probably if this is not 10, this is 14, probably 12 is already here, all the way here. Which is close to negative 1, so most likely our charge at pH 12 is negative 1. And we're quite consistent. Now let me clear something. So I have to erase everything. Assuming that at pH, you know, 5.5, my charge is 0. What if I ask you, given the method that we've been doing so far, what if my pH is 9.0? Well, now you can see if this is 2.4, this is 9.9. .9, so like, I don't know, 2.4, so this is 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 
So probably 9.0 is here, right here. And here, it's here at 0. It points to 0 because it's in the middle of 2.49.9. .9. But, you know, 9.0 .9 and 9.9 .9 are very close, right? It's like, it's like, hey, I'm so close to 9.9. .9. Can't I have some of these negative ones here since I'm much closer to 9.9 .9 than 2.4? And actually, that is reality. That th This is an added layer of complexity, but this makes things more accurate that, you know, just because your pH is between 2.4 and 9.9 .9 doesn't mean that you have the exact same scenario at pH 5.5 at pH 9.0. Maybe at pH 5.5, which is pretty much the middle of 2.4 and 9.9, you'll really get almost zero. But at 9.0, you're, you're already going to the right, meaning you should have more of this as you approach 9.9. .9. So, therefore, if I'm going to gonna put that in that you know aspect or in that perspective maybe what what this could tell us is that at pKa of 9.9 .9, I mean at pH of 9.9 .9, when you hit exactly 9.9 .9, which matches the pKa so when pH is equal to this pKa maybe I get an equal match of this or maybe if my pH is 2.4 which is exactly the same as pKa 2.4 maybe I get an equal mix of one and zero. Or maybe another thing, if this is the middle of one and zero, this is the middle of zero and one, doesn't that make the charge of zero the middle of these two values? And this is significant because in biochemistry we have something called the isoelectric pH. And the isoelectric pH is the pH where all and I mean all amino acid species have a charge of zero. In other words, are neutral. In other words, are zwitter ionic. And basically, if I try to get the pH that strikes this middle, this zero, I get my isoelectric pH. So how do I get there? I just mentioned a while ago that maybe to get zero, exactly zero, I get the middle of 2.4 and 9.9. .9. Doesn't that mean average? Yeah, it's average. So what we're going to do is the isoelectric pH is equal to 2.4 plus 9.9 .9 divided by 2. So that's like 12.3 uh, divided by 2 is 6.15. So therefore, I can say that 6.15 is the isoelectric pH. That at 6.15, I get none of the positive 1 charges. I get none of the negative 1 charges. Everything, all, have a charge of 0. Okay? And we will have another example later. How about this one? Estimate the charge of pro proline, I mean, at pH 9. So we can use the shortcut method we've been doing so far. So if this is 0, so this is... Uh, the pH is equal to 2.0. This is pH equal to 10.6. So maybe 9 is somewhere here, right? So it's probably somewhere here. So it tells us that since 9 is between 2 and 10.6, we get a lot of 0. So maybe 0 is the safest answer if, you know, a test question is just asking for one charge. But if there is, for example, an option wherein you have 0 and then since 9 is cl close to 10.6 compared to 2, Zero and a little bit of negative one. That's the more accurate answer. How about the isoelectric pH? Oh, by the way, uh, the isoelectric pH can be symbolized by IPH or PI. I prefer PI because it's just two letters. So how do you solve the PA for this, just in case? Well, zero. Then these are the two numbers. Average. It's that easy. 2.0, it's 10.6, divided by 2, so that... 12.6 divided by 2, 6.3. You're done. Now let's look at these two questions. Estimate the charge of asp aspartic, this is aspartic acid, at pH 7.5. PKAs. What's this? We have three PKAs. That's odd because so far we only have two PKAs ever, right? How about this? Find the PI, so isoelectric uh, pH of lysine. It also has three pKa's, and of course, um, if this is the first time you encounter this, the normal question in your head should be, 
in the first place, why is there a third PKA? Why is it not just two? And that's the question that we want to answer first. So, what to do with three PKA amino acids? If you find a biochemistry textbook, and then you find a table of PKAs for all the 20 amino acids, you would find that seven have three PKA values. And let me correct this letter. I just noticed it's the wrong letter. All right, so this is good for now. D is aspartate, E is glutamate. These are the acidic amino acids, right? Histidine, lysine, and arginine are the basic amino acids, right? Remember, acidic is acidic because they can have a negative charge. Basic is basic because of the positive charge. Now, what's the sustain in tyrosine? Sustain has an SH group, which can become S-, and tyrosine has its phenolic OH, which can become O-. Given that they can potentially ionize to a negative charge just like acids, but they are not acidic amino acids per se, we know that. I, I don't know what to give this, so probably I'm just going to invent a word, acidic-like amino acids. So these seven have three PKAs. So why is that? Remember, by default, we're always going to have two pKa values because of these two functional groups. The NH2, which gives a positive charge, and the COOH, which gives a negative charge. But isn't it that an acidic amino acid has an R group with another COOH? And you cannot ignore that COOH you know, you're, where you're like, hey, if this COOH can have a negative charge, then so can this COOH as well. So meaning, if COOH has a positive pKa here, then the COOH at the bottom must have its own pKa value, which we call pKa-R. The same with basic. So this has a positive charge, so this is, I mean, this can have a positive charge, so this is the first pKa, can have a negative charge, the second pKa, but being basic, they have an R group, which has another amino group that can become positive, the third pKa. Okay. So now, how about our shortcut notation here? Will this change? Of course. Why? Because, remember, the positive one here is made responsible by this NH2 group. The negative one here is made possible by our COOH here. But now, all of a sudden, we have an extra COOH that can have a negative charge. So meaning that on top of this negative one, this second COOH can give us another negative charge, giving us a potential for negative 2 because of our R group here. Now, for the basic one, it's slightly different. Of course, again, this one is responsible for this. This is responsible for this. But the R group can give us a positive charge, so meaning from positive 1, this can amplify that and go further to positive so you see here that the shortcut diagrams are different, slightly different, obviously because of the charges that are possible. And that's the first thing. So meaning, if you encounter a question with three pKa values, the first question in your head is, wait, is my amino acid acidic or acidic-like or basic? Right. And then after that, all you need to do is to put pKa1, pKa2 and pKa3 in order. And by the way, at this point, notice I'm not anymore using like pKa COOH, something that I've been doing before. Because in this case, it doesn't matter. Who cares if this pKa is for the COOH? The fact that it's, for example, pKa1 is the smallest number among the three means I put it here. Or pKa2 is the middle number between pKa1 and 3, I put it here. Or pKa3 is the highest number among the three, I put it here. The same applies to basic amino acids. And just in case you're asked to get the IPH or the PI or the isoelectric pH, it makes sense that for zero, you average pKa1 and pKa2. Or meaning the isoelectric pH is the average of the two smaller or lower values. The pKa3 is between negative 1 and negative 2, so it doesn't have anything to do with 0. So the highest number here is not part of the computation. So it's like pKa1 plus pKa2 
divided by 2. That's the formula here. Okay, what's more important is that you're aware of what we're talking about in this diagram. In this case, for basic amino acids, it changes because what you now average are pKa2 and pKa3, which are the two higher values. So for the isoelectric pH of basic, you average this time not the two lower, but the two higher numbers or higher values. And this time, the tables have turned. The smallest number is not included because it's not it's the one not beside zero in, uh, in this case. So given that, let's try to apply this to the remaining questions we had here. So first, we have to acknowledge that we have an acidic amino acid. So we're going to have to adopt these set of numbers. Positive 1, 0, negative 1, negative 2. Then arrange the three pKa's in order. 2.1, 3.9, 9.9. Well, here, we're not really asked to compute the isoelectric pH, but just find the charge of aspartate at 7.5. Well, this is 3.9, 9.9, so 7.5 is very close to the middle. So probably, the charge would be negative 1. Okay? But just in case we're asked for the isoelectric pH of aspartic acid, the pI is basically the average of these two. So like 2.1 plus 3.9 divided by 2. You do the math. Now for the last question, find the PI of lysine. And lysine is basic. So for basic, we're going to have to adopt the set of numbers starting with positive 2, positive 2, positive 1, 0, negative 1. Then place these in order 2.2, 9.2, 10.8. And since we're asked for the PI, let's solve all the way. So this is 0. So what you average are these two higher numbers. So the PI is 9.2 plus 10.8, that's 20. Okay, so 20 divided by 2, so that is exactly 10.0. So that's it about our ionization and computations of isoelectric pHs.